Well, we've had a, a huge amount of talk about the number of people who are out of work on benefits, long-term sickness, or so whether you should, uh, if you've refused a job, you should have to take you know, the next job that comes your way. Yeah, we've got more than four million people on out-of-work benefits. One in five adults between the age of 18 and 64 are not in work at all. Now, there might be some people who are between the ages of 18 and 64 who've done very well in life, chosen to retire early, chosen to be the primary caregiver, are a carer. There are lots of reasons why people might legitimately yeah, you get so little not be amount in the work money. labour force. You get so... You don't get a lot of money for being a carer. No, but there are lots of legitimate reasons why people might not be in the labour force. There are, however, uh, there has been a, a, a spike. A spike in those who are not in employment in the last two years. Now, the question is, why? And could these, some of these people actually be in work with the right policy and with the right incentives? Yes, because fundamentally you need people in work to pay benefits and to pay for the welfare system. And if it's too imbalanced, then either your government's going to get into even more debt or there simply isn't going to be enough for those who have very, very legitimate claims for welfare. Well, anyway, a senior Tory MP has suggested that he's gone quite far to suggest that work shy people should be drafted into the armed forces to ease the labour crisis there. Well, of course, we've been discussing those latest figures. Almost four million people now out of work in the UK and living on benefits. And that the unemployment rate has risen to 3.9%. So would it be a wise move if people who turn down multiple jobs are conscripted to the armed forces? Well, Robert Fox, uh, editor, defence editor at The Standard, says they should not be in the army. Robert, why should they not be? This is, uh, you know, if someone has said no to one, two, three jobs, could this not be a, a good way of getting them back into some kind of work? Well, the way you put it and the way uh, Mr Drax, a senior Tory MP, has put it in the Telegraph uh, today, um, it would be a complete pain. Uh, it would be a pain all round because the one group that really doesn't want this is reluctant conscripts is the military because uh, the professional militaries don't like conscripts, national service personnel anyway. Um, although I think we can argue that a bit further down the line, they will have to come to some national service scheme. But whether it's conscription or compu by compulsion by law is really a very open question. And it will be very difficult. It will cause a lot of aggro. Um, it's a political hot potato and it would be useless because you would get reluctant squaddies uh, who wouldn't be uh, up to doing much and they would be draining very, very valuable training resources from all three militaries. But I'm sure there can be part-time and voluntary schemes to get round it, because the problem of the demographic winter, let's call it what it is by its technical term, of people dropping out of the workforce and not being replaced, uh, it's right across most of the developed world, is even hitting China now, and we've got to do something about it. But Robert Fox, isn't this how the Navy was built? In the 1700s, you had press gangs that went pub to pub, got the people who'd fallen asleep because of how drunk they'd got, chucked them on a boat, and they woke up somewhere in the mid-Atlantic, suddenly finding out they're in the Navy. That's how this country was built. <laughs> yeah, but they weren't necessarily Brits. And you are such a terrible nostalgic. <laughs> really, you know, you're, there's nothing. Your, your youth, you should look forward. You should be... Full of the optimism of the will, like me, of saying, we've got a problem, we're going to resolve it. Uh, the, the services have got a problem. How we fix that is a big and very important question. And a very senior general, General Sir Patrick Sanders, current head of the army, not for much longer, got a bit out of order in saying that he thinks there will have to be some kind of volunteer, but national service scheme. And everybody said, no, no, no. By the way, they said, no, no, no. So vehemently, you know darn well that they are really thinking about this behind the scenes, that, that they are. But um, 
I'm uh, I'm not nostalgic for the for for, for the navy of Trafalgar <laughs> or the uh, army of Waterloo. Oh, you should which be was barely Brit. <laughs> you think you're going to be I'm going to be a full of Dutch people. Go on, yeah. <laughs> uh, Robert, Robert, Richard Drax. He is a former army captain. He must know a few yes. things or thing or two about uh, the armed forces, and Need he is talking in particular about the young. So let's say we've had a huge spike in the number of people between the age of 18 and 24 who are not in work. Surely it wouldn't be, it's not that crazy an idea to think, well, maybe you could be a little bit of use in the armed forces. It's an obvious idea. And what I'm trying to say in, in sensible mode, putting it in the way that Richard has done. I mean, he's got a good argument, but it won't work. Mm. What I'm trying to do is to find something that does work. And Emily, you're absolutely right, because uh, we're looking at, it's actually, Tom, up to 5 million that are mm. claiming benefit, just dropped out of work. Why young people are not going into work? This is not a, 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 a quite old man talking about it, but it is a phenomenon which we're observing across the world. It is a major crisis. Well, Robert, perhaps, I mean, perhaps like... there's a middle ground here, which is instead yes. of conscription, a much more thorough recruitment process, because so many of these people who are not in work um, will claim anxiety, will claim nervousness, will claim perhaps a, a, a sense of, of, of a lack of, of, of knowing what to Confident, do with their lives in the right. army. The army can yeah. be something that really does change yes. people, does make people who they are. Oh, you're such a brain box. You've got way ahead in the argument, and I'm absolutely with you, Tom, on this. But it's a change of mindset that we need, because this has been noted, as I said, that something like we're going to lose between now or just uh, at the beginning in a decade, 2.7 million from a workforce not being replaced, coming up for retirement. We've got to find out, we have some pretty good ideas, why this has happened. And there's a thing that goes very much with what you have just been proposing and explaining, is why young people do not want to expose themselves to ridicule, to worry, to anxiety, by going into public service, because this is right across the piece, whether it's uh, the, the civil service or the other aspects of the security service. I'm sure that the police are having quite a tough time, and uh, and it is certainly a problem with the military. There's something wrong about the way the military is setting out its stall. Can I just finish with the very strong point that you made, and this is, I know, is what they're looking at. This qualified, almost a scholarship thing, come in for a, uh, it would be, I think it would have to be a year, but it come in for 10 months service of various kinds and we will give you, we'll pay you a basic wage, but we will give you a bounty, we will give you a scholarship, we will offer you some training. That's the Norwegian model. But the trouble is that the Norwegian military and their military, uh, their, their international police force, the people who guard you in the front, is of very high quality. Um, the chief of the Norwegian army was saying to a friend of mine the other day, the trouble is they come in on a voluntary basis and they really rather like it. And we can't get huh. rid of our volunteers. <laughs> we can't think too many. There you go. Absolutely pertinent at the moment is Finland and the total defence concept that they mm. call it. We call it comprehensive defence, and I know. We have been looking at it. Get people in, but make sure that there's a sense of purpose behind it so you've got some military or public service. It doesn't necessarily have to be military. Experience, training in your back pocket. Well, I worry, Robert, sometimes that uh, young people don't have a strong enough sense of national pride to even want to join the armed forces. They may ideologically be against the whole thing. Obviously, I don't want to generalise, but I mean, if yeah. you look at what uh, a lot of young people seem to think, perhaps they wouldn't be willing to fight for their country. But we'll have to. I, mean, end I, it there. I, I have to say, it sounds that I'm all with Team Tom uh, this afternoon, but because I, I have difficulty um, and don't think for cynical reasons with the national pride. I've been with fighting armies when they were fighting, and when the when the chips were down. I don't think, you know, Second Talon Parachute Regiment, which really actually turned the Falklands campaign yeah. at Goose Creek, mm. it was a battle they should have lost, and they just kept going. And they kept going because of each other and because mm. they had not spree. They were an elite outfit, and, and, they, and they kept going. Yeah. A, a, it's the unity God. of purpose, the camaraderie, all of the things Absolutely. the army offers. Absolutely. Uh, Robert, thanks. Fox, thank you so much for talking Thank us through you. that. And um, I, might, I might have to take back my advocacy of press ganging.